Hey everybody, I am so excited. My name is Marco. If you're new to the channel, I like to talk about video game music and I am joined today with Austin Wintery. I'm Austin Wintery. I'm a composer who who writes occasionally video game music. That's all there is to it. <laughs> I've been a big fan of your music now for many years and, and obviously Journey was a fundamental like cornerstone of, it's so funny. I still remember when I, I played, I think it was, I played it in like 2013 or something and I was surrounded by people and they were sort of like, what is this game? I feel like a large part of the reason why that game, beyond the fact that it's beautiful, is also just the the score is just so sublime. And I think it really highlights, you know, these concepts of life and death and, and what, what it means to exist. And I, I've often thought about the cello solo signifying the player and I sort of wanted your insight a little bit on on that. What was your sort of thought process when you were composing that? It's hard to generalize it because if I say, oh, well, the thought process is X, it makes it seem like I had this kind of spark of inspiration and just set about writing. The reality is that it took three years to write because I was involved from the earliest days. The game didn't exist. I mean, there wasn't even concept art. And so there would be pieces of music that I would write that were inspired by little more than a conversation with Genova or with the art director, Matt Nava or other members of the team. And so over time started to kind of get a clearer and clearer vision of what it should be. Now, aesthetically, from the very beginning, I, I centered it around a cello solo solely on the idea that there needed to have a kind of lonesome quality. That's all it was where Genova just said, let's think of a theme that could kind of serve as almost a thesis statement of what Journey is. And he described this desert landscape, something very kind of barren, with the idea being that we make players feel very alone and sort of vulnerable, then we connect them online to someone else. And that should feel very cathartic and very emotional and very meaningful. And so it, it can't be thus if you haven't kind of deprived them first. So I found myself saying, well, can I represent that in 90 seconds? Very simply, a melody played by cello solo that then becomes a much lusher, fuller arrangement of the same idea, showcasing this kind of progression towards something connected. That's all I had to really start with. Over time, what you said became the, the realization where I thought this is almost developing into a like a cello concerto in video game form. The cello really is the through line. It didn't have to be that way. It could have been, oh, the cello is just a sound that we associate with the early part of the game. And then it becomes this and then it becomes that. I've approached other scores like that as well. There's no rule about how this is approached, just kind of whatever seems to click with the internal logic of it. And so in this case, it ended up where each instrument kind of had a symbolic value. So you have the cello is you, the harp, and to a degree, the viola solo as a kind of echo of the cello represent the other player. So you only even hear those if you connect online. Like mm -hmm. if, you're, if your internet is down, you'll never even hear those instruments in the mix at any point so that it's sort of tied to the real-time nature of your dynamic with another player. The flute, but particularly the bass flute, is associated with what we call the ancestors, you know, the sort of tall white versions of you. The serpent, this esoteric 16th century instrument that I, I use in a few spots, is kind of the thread of what we sometimes call the guardians, the sort of large snake-like kind mm. of golem or like dragons. And then the last one is the sort of orchestral strings ended up becoming emblematic of the mountain. So that the closer you get, the more you hear them, which is why you don't hear them at all at the beginning. And then by the end, where what we now call apotheosis is it's like all strings and cello. So that it's, it's sort of, they're almost like a proximity detector to your to your distance from the from the summit of the mountain. So, the, But these were things that as I went kind of occurred to me, and then it was a matter of, okay, now how do I make sure I'm consistent with this? It's not just arbitrary or it's not just, oh, well, the flute sometimes means that. It's like, no, no, that actually, it always means that. I, I'm a big fan of imposing rules on myself. I like that it forces you to be creative. You know, you have to, you have to think, oh, well, if I'm only allowed to use the cello for this, then I better think of a way to make that work with a solo cello. You know what I mean? It's so interesting how when we compose or when we, we sort of give things away, as it were, like whether it's singing or composing, oftentimes once we release it into the world, it becomes something that is really not ours anymore. And, and I, and I sort of wonder, like, do you feel a certain degree of ownership towards the pieces that you write? You know, it's interesting. I guess in an emotional sense, I like the idea that it stops really being mine. Okay. For example, I got a wedding invitation last year, a friend of mine, a engineer and percussionist I work with. And I was one of a couple hundred or a hundred or whatever guests. There was nothing particular to my invitation. But when it came time after the ceremony for him to do his first dance, to my complete bewilderment, he had chosen I Was Born For This From Journey as his music for the first dance and had not told me he was going to do that. It was sort of uh, shocking. And what I loved was that that piece now represents something totally different for him 
forever than it will ever mean to me and to mm-hmm. anyone else that hears it because it's associated now with his new wife, with that event. He's kind of grafted on meaning to it that's his. And n- not only do I have no interest in interfering with that, I don't even think I could if I wanted to, especially because when you're lucky enough that music gets out into the world widely enough that people are forming these kinds of personal relationships with it that you don't even know of. You know, for all I know, a thousand people have used it at their weddings as a first dance. And I just never heard about it because they just, you know, pulled it MP3 down from the internet and played it out of a speaker in the wedding and never thought to email me to say so or something like that. I have no idea. Maybe he's the only one ever and it'll never happen again. It's hard to say. Point being, I have gotten enough emails over the years of things like that, where people incorporate it into their life one way or the other. Even if, even if it's just somebody saying, oh, you know, I loop this at night because it helps me sleep or whatever. It was, took me a while to not be insulted by that because I thought it puts you to sleep. Uh, and uh, <laughs> it, it was because I've never, music wakes me up. So I've never, I've never put it on to fall asleep. And so it was a hard, it took me a while to realize that I'm actually unusual in this way and that people were paying me this great compliment, but it took me a long time to hear it as a nice <laughs> thing. I was yeah. like, I was always like, I'm a little insulted, but point is, I so this whole notion of kind of the disappearance or the death of the author, that, that whole line of thinking, I find fascinating. And my attitude is, look, one should be so lucky. Like if you're Jeff Bridges, who plays the dude from the Big Lebowski and it's this iconic role, this character that everybody knows. And somebody goes and dresses up that way in Halloween because they saw that movie. And then you ask them, oh, you're a big uh, Jeff uh, Bridges fan. And they go, I've never heard of Jeff Bridges. They just, to them, it's the dude. It's like, at this point, it's sort of transmutated and gotten to degrees of separation where the character has this life of its own. I see that as only a positive. That means he put something out into the world that sort of became alive onto itself. And and as artists, we should be so lucky to have something even approach that level. So all that said, the reason why I said emotionally, this is how I feel. I was one of those people in 1997 that had no issue with George Lucas reissuing the Star Wars trilogy because he felt like they were incomplete originally. Because I said, it's his creation. If he wants to try to improve it, the people that are out there going, he has no right. It's ours now. I go, no, it's definitely his. (laughs) That's not remotely debatable. The one thing where I side with them on is I think it was stupid to try to erase the previous iteration because I go, you know, some people might not like your changes and it's just bad entrepreneurship to limit the consumer's options. So have a 77 version and a 97 version yeah. as two items in your catalog. Uh, I don't understand the I don't understand the issue there. In the same way that I I, I just went and saw Madama Butterfly at the Metropolitan Opera in New York, mm-hmm. and I was reading about how there's something like five different versions that Puccini yeah. did. You know, there's the the sort of deeply fraught, unsuccessful initial one, and then the iterations and improvements. But interestingly, the very last one that he did is not always the one that people perform. Sometimes it's the one prior to that that had very slight little changes and, you know, orchestral balances and, and scene lengths and things like that, subtle changes. Where, so I go, okay, well, you know, this is hardly a new phenomenon, in other words. Yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting thing, isn't it, where, where we get into this discussion quite a bit on, on my channel about, you know, context versus no context, whether or not you need to feel things as they're written or can can things exist outside. And, and I... I, I sort of gravitate, you know, a decade in the music industry for me in, in, in the classical music world and listening to things before ever seeing the operas. I never, almost never saw the operas before hearing them. Right. And and for me, I actually, I personally, and like, I felt this way about all of Joe Hasaishi's work because I, I went down a really intense studio Ghibli rabbit hole. And when I heard the themes prior and then connected to them emotionally within the context of this of the cinematic universe. I actually was like, oh my God, that's that piece. I, I love this piece. This is whatever, Spirited Away or Kiki's Delivery Service, like the main theme. And and it's it's interesting how a lot of folks uh, really need, and which is okay, um, really need to have, well, this is the music that plays when I'm crossing the desert or whatever, but, but there are others who were like, well, actually I just, this makes me feel X, Y, Z. And it's not necessarily correct, but it, 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 it's an interesting discussion about what is correct when we're discussing something as like sort of nebulous as music, which truly cannot have a definition besides what we've structured around it. You know, it's, it's a funny thing. In the end, we can't control the context in which somebody hears a thing uh, for the first time. And so I fall back on, some of the wisdom that was imparted on me by my early composition teachers, particularly, I remember this being a 
there was a composer, Charles Fussell, who I studied with in New York, who taught at Eastman principally, I think. You know, he was one of those, uh, he, he'd been around the, the, the sort of classical music block for many, many, many years. Um, you know, he's quite close with Virgil Thompson, who was one of oh, the sure. deans of the Americana sound with mm -hmm. Copeland, you know, that kind of thing. And he had been a Pulitzer finalist, I think for an opera, in fact, although I'm blanking on the piece now off the top of my head. In any case, very much of the classical tradition. I remember being a young 18 year old idiot. I can't remember what I said about the piece of mind that I was doing. It was something along, I probably was something like, oh, well, you just need to understand X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z. And he goes, how will the audience ever know that? You know, he said that, that you can't, even if it's something where you go, it ha if I put it in program notes at a concert or in liner notes on an album or something, yeah, they may not read it. He said, your music must be able to stand as music alone. And then additional context might give you a, an interesting bit of, of extra interest, you know, but if you hear case in point, Madama Butterfly, the big moment towards the end of that, that has the, the signature, just quintessential Puccini moment that she sings towards the very end. The first time I ever heard that piece of music was in an episode of The Simpsons when I was like nine <laughs> years old. <laughs> I associated it with that for 15 years. Yeah. I was talking actually to my friend who I, wa who I saw this performance with. I was telling him that after it was over. I said, you know, the funny thing is that you know, I've come a long way since then, but I still, there's still part of me that always will think of this one particular moment from The Simpsons when I hear Which this piece. Is. <laughs> yeah. And I said, but to Puccini's credit, particularly the opera as a whole, I mean, Butterfly is like, good God, talk about one of the most just emotional. My friend goes, it's not even emotionally positive anymore. He said, this is just such a devastating piece of storytelling that it's almost torturous and painful. You're asking for someone to hurt you. And I really felt that. I really felt that uh, seeing it, this production. It's a testament to Puccini that in context, to your point, seeing it where it's no longer just this the single that you find on Spotify because it's mm. the that everybody knows, but it's the culmination of two hours of just increasingly painful storytelling, even with, oh, I associate this with this one silly moment from the episode of Simpsons. It really, <laughs> it really bulldozes over that. Yeah, and you just yeah. realize in the proper context, it's hard not to appreciate it for how, what it's meant to be. Yeah. Uh, and not every piece can do that. I wonder about like a young kid watching Jaws, for example, where mm. that motif is so part of popular culture and it's mostly heard in the context of parody. Yeah. You know, you yeah. Think yeah. of like Commercial Michael or... and Dwight in, yeah. the, Simps in the, the office where they're getting, they're in the car getting ready to go poach a sales job and they're going dun dun with the mustache. You know? Yeah, exactly. Like people think of Jaws in a way that's so distilled that they forget that in 1977, I mean, sorry, 1975, people were literally afraid to go to the <laughs> beach. And that music is a big part of it. That movie was so terrifying that they like beaches had tourist problems. Yeah. <laughs> um, the Jaws effect, you know? Yeah. And uh, now it's 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 become a meme. But I think if you sat down a 10 year old and you showed them Jaws and you turn the lights down and you just let that movie do its work, probably it'd still scare the absolute living crap out of them <laughs> because the context is that, you know, anyway, tangents on your question about how important context is. Bottom line, TLDR, if the music is well written, it should hopefully survive all amount of context switching. But ideally, in context, is still the best version of it. Yeah. Well, it's an interesting thing. I mean, to your point about Madama Butterfly, I, I sang Madaba Butterfly, I think about six or seven times. So, but, but as Pinkerton. So for me, it was like a little oh, different. Yeah. And for those yeah, of you sure. that don't know Pinkerton, he's, he's an absolute terrible person. And then the foil of the plot, he's the reason everything. Sort happens. of a, he's sort of a, he's sort of an asshole, but he's also kind of an idiot. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. yeah. Not really. I don't see him as like uber malicious so much no. as sort of dumb. He's Ignorant, yeah. He yeah. Didn't, he didn't think about his actions, and so it, yeah. it was always really interesting. Uh, I remember I was listening to the to the uh, love duet, which is quite long. It's it's a twenty minute scene, and I always remember I was at school and I was listening to it, and I was like, "This is fine. It's nice. It's yeah, it's, right. It's pleasant. It's it's languid and you know whatever." And then I saw it. And I was like, oh, yeah. that's amazing. And then that's when I locked in. Cause you know, we, we excerpt arias for like auditions and things like that. So for me, I was always like, I'm always singing these arias, but to hear them within the context of the piece, it's an interesting thing. And, and to your point about Puccini too, which is very topical. And I just, I'm about to drop a video about this today, actually. But you know, what, what is your perspective on melody? And I feel like you're a very melodic composer. Do you feel like melody 
is is king when it comes to writing it, it obviously depends on the context but for for video games i suppose in this particular case on a basic level if you're asking me in the abstract completely outside of games versus film versus sure. opera versus a, a symphony or a string quartet or a pop song or whatever as you know better than i humans are monophonic instruments so i've always felt that melody it's not just you remember a, a catchy tune seemingly better than a harmonic progression right or a texture though sometimes the Ligeti requiem the kyrie as famously used in 2001 that is a texture piece and goddamn if that's not memorable but yeah right. as a friend of mine always used to say about Ligeti, don't try that at home <laughs> uh Ligeti had a magical touch that few composers did and imitating him is at your peril but setting aside that i think just historically if you ask people, name me your top 10 piece of music. If you say, hey, sing it for me. What are they left with if not the echoing a melody? It is all we can physically reproduce. Right. And if we're singing along, even if in our head, it's monophonically. It's hardwired on a biological level. It, never mind that it's often presented as the topmost sort mm -hmm. of cherry on top it, it, compositionally or production wise, mix wise, all that kind of thing. But it's, it's literally our, our physical way in. So I think if the goal is to be memorable, melody probably is king. I, I have yet to be uh, <laughs> persuaded that that's not the case. Because look, I go every year like a religious pilgrimage to John Williams at the Hollywood Bowl. So jealous. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, you got to come, man. He'll do best of of his own work and he'll also pay homage to great other music from Hollywood from throughout the eras. What's the one thing they always have in common? It's a memorable theme or a memorable yeah. hook or something. Yeah. So I am a believer in this. Now, sometimes the right thing is a feather touch and it doesn't necessarily need to be especially melodic. And there are also some melodies that would barely register as a melody. And it's really more of an under the hood look that you realize, oh, there actually is kind of a tune there. But yeah, but sometimes it's a shape, you know, it's a contour. Uh, sometimes it is really a texture or it's a color. I, I'm, I'm very equal opportunity in my writing and I think everything has its place. But if the goal is to be memorable for the audience, I think that's your best bet. Now that can take a lot of shapes. You know, Dan Pemberton is a friend who I, I think is a brilliant composer. And if you look at his score in, in um, the Spider-Verse films, those are melodic in a very, you know, like Beethoven three or four notes kind of way, because yeah. his thinking was righteously, especially in the sequel. I want to sprinkle these motifs throughout where the character might only be on screen for frames at a time, because this movie is so schizophrenically kind of hyperactive in its visual language that you need to be able to clock a motif in seconds. Yeah. And so, you know, bum, 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 na, 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 na. you're already like, they've been off screen already for three quarters of the runtime of that already. So his melodies, you know, you look at like the Gwen Stacy with this, you know, it's, yeah. it, that's all that it is. It's, it's, it's a gesture, but it's, it's memorable. And, and he always pairs it with, with particular sounds as well. Like unique, interesting electronic colors and that kind of thing. And so, that's still a form of melodic writing as far as I'm concerned, even though it's compressing it down to what's the smallest bit that could still sort of qualify. So yeah, these are definitely things I think about. But you know, I just, my, one of my, my most recent game that came out is Lego Fortnite with Epic. And that's an a almost exclusively textural score. And that was actually part of my pitch because I said, what do Legos represent? They represent potential. They represent creative undertaking by the player, by the user. So Rather than try to paint a specific portrait of that, what if this is music that's trying to sound like it's the embodiment of creativity itself? Well, that to me felt mm. very open-ended. That to me felt very nebulous. Creativity is like walking in the mist. You don't know where <laughs> it's going. I said, the music should feel like that. So it's actually, there is a theme. It's kind of plays on the home screen and that's about it. The rest of it is very deliberately meant to feel open-ended. As yeah. it turns out, that's also very compatible with thousands of hours of open-ended gameplay as well, where it doesn't feel like it's sort of beating you to death. Building and stuff. But it was about a philosophical approach more than anything else. But that's the beauty, I think, of music ultimately, isn't it? Is that th there are so many different ways you can base it on emotion, you can base it on a thought process, you can base it on anything, and all of it is legitimate. From the opera background, it is interesting to me that almost always the default ends up being showcasing an emotion and getting someone somewhere to feel something. And I think that that's the most beautiful thing about music. And it's something I really try to emphasize on the channel. Because when I started the channel, I was like, well, I'm not a composer, so this is going to be a really hard sell. But then what I realized is that actually we have so much that we can uncover of, of, of phrasing, of texture and how it makes us feel and how we can more deeply connect 
to this stuff that's like just like here that's a gold mine for human emotion and uh it's so easy for us to get sort of distracted by well well the chord progressions and the way that the the violins come in at this part and stuff it's it's a really interesting thing i've always been driven insane by my friends and colleagues that think that is what makes it work. You know, you see these videos occasionally on YouTube that are, you know, the reason why Sarah McLaughlin makes you cry is because of this interval. And I'm like, <laughs> oh my God. You know, like if that was true, every piece of music, and it would have long predated any of us, you know, this would have happened centuries ago, would have all converged on a very narrow set of tricks. And it's obviously not been the case. Music has gotten wider and wider and wider. One of the few times that I've openly wept in the theater was seeing Hamilton. There's just about nothing in that show that would have made sense to Puccini from a from a musical language standpoint. You know, the palette has just gotten so massive and there's so many different ways to kind of poke at the human condition, you know, and 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 it all has the potential. As a friend of mine, the friend that I went to the opera with, in fact, his name is Andrea a big emotional Italian guy. He, um, <laughs> I don't know anything about that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. His whole thing is there's really only two kinds of music, that which makes an emotional connection and that which doesn't. And how it gets there, there's infinite ways of that. But all music boils down to one of one of those two things. And it, it doesn't matter if it's lushly, syrupy, saccharine, melodic music, or if it's atonal sound design or anything in between some subset will make a connection and the rest won't yeah and hey i mean pierre lunaire can still scare the shit out of somebody you know <laughs> so, oh man there are so many the very first ever film score that was purely electronic was mid-50s film forbidden planet which was done by a husband wife team named lewis and baby baron and it was done through 1950s electronics which was not synthesizers this was soldering irons on circuit boards creating essentially you know physical noise making machines yeah very, very early, early uh, uh, way to approach this. The musicians' union at the time was so skeptical that this even counted as music. They were not permitted to be labeled as original music. The credit was like electronic tonalities. Oh, boy. <laughs> That's what the score of that film was legally required to be called. <laughs> because they said that's not music, you know. So, oh, and so nowadays, weird. you know, the idea that electronic music is not music. Right. I mean, how long has it been since anyone said anything remotely that stupid? <laughs> Do you, and this will segue into sort of this plug that we have here for you know for symphony new hampshire but do you think that we are arriving at a point now your music obviously has done the rounds and has been featured in many symphony orchestras across the world and it continues to be what every year basically correct uh luckily enough so far i don't think i've actually had since especially since journey came out it's often like dozens of performances a year it's it's very surreal honestly do you feel like we're reaching a point where the public on mass is well, this is, I'm going to phrase this in an interesting way, but A, ready for video game music to be at the forefront of like, to be in people's like symphony performances. And also B, do you feel like we're at a point where people are starting to wake up or, or, or maybe they already have to the idea that video game music is a legitimate and valuable, you know, without even labeling it video game music. Cause we can get into the discussion about labels and what that even means. But I would actually almost flip that question. Um, I would say, are the dwindling numbers of classical subscribers ready for the fact that their orchestras are are in a sense put to better use performing music that the public in mass has been chomping at the bid for for decades decades yeah major artists like sting or rolling stones it is a feat for a group like that to sell out the hollywood bowl because it is an eighteen thousand seat venue and every year like clockwork john williams sells out three nights that's 50,000 plus people in a single weekend that go to see orchestral music exclusively from film. And most of which is by one guy. Right. Of course, it's <laughs> emblematic of film itself because, you know, yeah. E.T., Jurassic Park, Star Wars, Indiana Jones, all in quick succession and feel like it's a, it's a, it's the history of cinema. Yeah. And then you go, oh, it's actually just his catalog. <laughs> um, so point is, this has resonated with people for a long time. I mean, decades a day. I mean, John Williams was conducting the Boston Pops and concerts like this in the early 80s. Yeah. So this is nothing new, but increasingly orchestras are receptive to it. And video game music has, uh, you know, I mean, look, the BBC Proms did their first ever fully dedicated video game music a couple years ago. And uh, these things are becoming almost commonplace. So I don't think it's about the public being in mass. That would imply that the public in mass cares about what orchestras are even doing. 
And it's it's really the opposite. They might start caring when they realize, hey, my favorite game, Halo, is prominently featured in this concert this weekend. That would be cool. Let's go check that out. Because right now, there's a certain sense of you go to the orchestra when you go, you know what? It's a special occasion. I want to go do something fancy. I need a bit of culture in my life. And and for a lot of people, that's one very small breath away from a kind of elitist mm-hmm. attitude of, I want to go hang out with people that can afford a proper... One time, I went to go see West Side Story on a touring production here in LA, and I was stupid and and didn't account for LA traffic. And I got there just barely late enough that they held me at the door oh. until the opening was over and then they sneak <laughs> you in, right? So me and a dozen other people were sitting there listening to, you know, yeah. Yeah. from the lobby. I mean, I've seen West Side Story like 20 times. So it it, yeah. it, 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 it wasn't the end of the world, but it was, you know, still, I was like, damn it, this was so avoidable. And I missed it by like 30 seconds. Yeah. And I remember I was standing there and there was this very upset guy who had probably paid a lot of money for tickets right up front who kept berating the security guard who was holding the door shut and he said you know you need to let us in you don't understand like we paid a lot for these tickets and the guy goes i don't care I, my instructions are when the piece is over and the dialogue starts that's when you're allowed to go in and I, now that I, this wasn't my decision i just work here and the guy turns to his wife and in this loud voice so that all of us could hear he goes this guy's clearly never paid this kind of money for tickets <gasps> Um, and I just was so, hor- I was like, I'm not with this guy to be very clear. I felt so horrified to be kind of in the same oxygen sharing space. Yeah. He's such an asshole. And I thought this has always been a problem that the orchestral world is, you know, th- they do student rush tickets. They do all kinds of things to try to shake this association, but there's a certain amount of this is an elitist thing and not everyone is welcome. And the crazy thing is that when you talk to arts administrative people at orchestras, you talk to the musicians, none of them actually feel that way. It brings them, like there's a great <laughs> quote in, in John Cherry's uh, book, The War on Music, an interview that supposedly happened where someone was interviewing Verdi and said, you know, Wagner has written multiple books on his theory of the theater uh, as, his, as his kind of Italian counterpart and natural sort of rival, as it were. What is your theory of the theater, Mr. Verdi? And he said, I think the theater should be full. And that's that's Verity's <laughs> outlook on the theory of theater. And I could not agree more. It's like, we could be reaching people every last way. One thing the LA Phil did for years, I don't know if they do this anymore, but I thought was brilliant, was they would do these periodic casual Fridays where everyone in the orchestra would be dressed like this. They'd be wearing a hoodie and their jeans or whatever, including, you know, like Gil Shaham came in wow. and, and was doing, you know, solo. He's obviously famous violinist was coming in and was like the marquee performer but it was uh, it was part of casual friday so he comes out the same way and they would they would get a member of the orchestra to come and introduce the concert it'd be like our seventh violist please welcome joanne or what and someone would come out and say hey here's why this concert excites me and they would tell some personal story about like okay one of the like one year when that that time when gil sham was there a violinist in the orchestra named vj gupta came out and said my first sort of real exposure to high level professional playing was as a kid when I went to the Aspen Music Festival and Gil Sham was like the resident artist who was sharing insights with us and wisdom. And he was so inspiring to me. And the fact that I'm sharing the stage with him now as part of the LA Philharmonic is absolutely mind blowing to me. And so thank you all for coming or something like that. That was the introduction of the show. So unpretentious, so personal. You see this guy realizing, oh, he was you know a teenager. He got to share the stage. Now they're colleagues making music together. The audience... You can't not love that. In fact, I can prove it because the piece they played was the Berg Violin Concerto, probably one of the most unappealing pieces of music for a general (laughs) audience you could ever name. But they (laughs) seem to really get into it because they have a great performer. It's a decent piece. And they have this connection now to it. You know, that's that. So, yeah, I I think that um, it's not about audiences being ready it's that the orchestras need to be ready to be better stewards of this art form this incredible beautiful art form and this applies to opera companies and to chamber music ensembles you know find ways to connect with audience that includes the canon i'm not one of those types that's like get rid of this stuffy repertoire you know yeah Yeah. of course yeah one of the best concerts i ever this is pointed because this week the american youth symphony announced they were closing their doors that they could not figure out ways to stay financially sustainable but this would for many 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 decades been one of the premier youth orchestras i think in america they were la or los angeles uh, there were two two main ones that both are now gone the debut orchestra and the american youth symphony and and um 
American Youth Symphony would do shows at Royce Hall uh, uh, at UCLA and and amazing shows. I mean, you'd go and you'd listen to these kids. Some of them, kids in the orchestra, like 12 years old. Most of them were high school and early college age, like yeah. late teens, early 20s. But this is kind of their first taste of something like a professional orchestra. And they sounded like a full-on professional orchestra. These were good musicians. And it was seen as a good feeder program. It, it's a proper professional work. Right. And they would do these bold, interesting programs. You know, they did a three-year series once called the Jerry Goldsmith Project, where they did all these pieces from Jerry Goldsmith film scores that had never been done live um, uh, in, in concert, you know, sometimes to picture, sometimes not. It was amazing. They did one similarly, a three-year Danny Elfman project, and, and and they would often put classical rep on the concert as well. One year they did a concert that I was lucky to be a part of where they took three Sony PlayStation games, which were The Last Guardian, The Order 1886, and Journey. And they asked each composer, actually, I think because of runtime, they only asked two of the three of us. So Takeshi Furukawa, I think his music from The Last Guardian just stood on its own. But in the case of Jason Graves yeah. with The Order and with myself for Journey, they said, what is a piece of classical repertoire that inspires you? And we want to perform them as a couplet. So yeah. they did my suite from Journey of Nascent's Apotheosis and I Was Born for This in tandem with the 4C interludes from Benjamin Britten's Peter Grimes. And that was that was my pitch. And Jason Graves, The Order was paired with the Firebird suite. It was awesome. It was so, I was like, this is one of the best cons. And all three of us did a talk on stage beforehand uh you know with emily reese who flew in and, and kind of moderated and and we and we talked about our music and we talked about why we chose the music we did and then and the audience saw it and it was so it was so cool because there were people there that they saw video game music on the docket that's all they needed they came to saw that and then right. they got this very welcoming glimpse at some repertoire they may not have ever heard of you know and and may never hear again and it, i was like man this should be a template all concerts should be like this no, but this but was so awesome. That's that's what I I literally am advocating like every day. I, well, first of all, I didn't realize that you, that what you were inspired by the Benjamin Br the Peter Grimes C interludes because my God, they're so good. Anyway, that's a separate conversation. Just but. broadly, it wasn't it wasn't meant to suggest that Journey was specifically framed by that. It's more just that I like Peter Grimes, but the particularly the the interludes that's and the storm good. are just yeah, yeah some yeah. of the most evocative orchestral writing. I just so think good. Britain was excellent, and that's like Britain in peak form. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. I've sung Peter. Uh, I've sung in Peter Grimes, but Tour of the Screw too is just like exceptional. I, I sang Peter Quentin. That it was just like wow. It's it's really hard to learn, but well, yeah. Well, when you have a when you have Peter Pears as your <laughs> instrument, <laughs> uh, yeah. um, it's not uh, fair for everyone else who has to follow. Well, speaking of uh, game uh, symphony kind of nights, uh, there's actually two nights on March 23rd and 24th with the uh, Symphony New Hampshire, and we both know folks that organize that and run that and and uh that's really exciting and they're going to be featuring music from from journey correct yep they uh roger collier the conductor is someone i've known a long time he's been a very generous supporter of my work he's conducted journey a bunch uh with different orchestras all over and what we're talking about he's placed journey on concerts that it's the only piece of non-classical rep on the program you know he did a concert a number of years ago with the pacific symphony where apotheosis was just nudged in there with with other works. In fact, I'm blanking on what else was on the concert. Ironically, I think the Firebird Suite was also on that show, <laughs> just coincidentally. But so he and I have a long running friendship and and he's, like I said, been very supportive. And and occasionally he's invited me to guest conduct or he'll just conduct my music and I might get to attend or, or introduce it from the stage, that kind of thing. And so in the case of this one, he said, uh, Symphony New Hampshire is going to be doing an all game music concert. And uh, would you be interested in coming out and guest conducting? And I said, yeah, I'd love that. Let me know what else on the program because, you know, selfishly, there might be other things that are fun to conduct on there. And I saw that one of the kind of, at this point, it's safe to call it video game repertoire pieces of One Winged Angel from Final Fantasy VII one -winged is on that. So I said, I want to do that. I've never conducted that piece. I want to do that one too, just for fun. Because we've done this before. A couple of years ago, I conducted um, a suite they had arranged of the of music from Ludwig's of The Mandalorian uh, right. as uh, in tandem with Journey. Again, it's just for fun because I'm like, I'm making the whole trip. It would be fun to spend yeah, more yeah. time on the podium. It's just me being <laughs> selfish, honestly. But I really like it because it forces me to, you know, to go deeper. In fact, I was literally working through the score uh, uh, of this uh, just last night and really kind of amped some of the, the voice leading in ways that I'd never bothered to do because I conducting it forces you to 
yeah. under a tighter microscope. And I was like, it really is a pretty damn well written piece of music. I have it, to say, it's not etym- just catchy, the, but the etymology of how he made it, though, I mean, that's been up in the news recently. Just like you know, basically, I mean, Jigsaw puzzled the piece, and the the references to Rite of Spring in there are so interesting too, from a classical perspective. But got to really feel that absolutely. I feel like both of you, without blowing smoke, I actually mean this. I feel like both of you, both you and Uematsu, have really carved like uh, that that spot in the sort of history of video game music and video game storytelling. It's amazing to um, to be able to talk with you. And, and obviously, you know, I, I feel I feel lucky that we can talk about this stuff because I feel the last time I played Journey was uh, about a, it was a year, a year and a change after my dad had passed. And uh, mm-hmm. it takes on such a different meaning and, and your music, especially like it's it's so soulful and so driven by by melody and truth that it's um. It's really effective. And, you know, I'm grateful that we got the chance to have like a proper sit down chat. And, and obviously, you know, Symphony, New Hampshire, if you live in the area on March 23rd and 24th, uh, which is coming up very quickly uh, by the yeah. time this video comes out, uh, I, if you live in the area, you should make the trip for sure. And so for me, you know, thank you. Cause uh, you know, oh, to me, the kind, dream is untrue. I mean, like I said, like I told you 10 years ago playing that game and now here I am and I can casually message you anytime I want. <laughs> so it's like, I'm, I'm well, and we'll do this. Well, you know, this, obviously this was put together kind of last minute, but I know we'd been, we'd been sort of flirting with, with making it happen. And it's, it's honestly, I, I've just basically keep periodically going back down below water uh, and, and, and sort of taking care of business and then resurfacing and hoping that the threads I left hanging are not someone on the other end going, you know, dude, come on, don't be a jerk. So I appreciate oh. your pain, but we'll, we'll let's do this again soon and 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 cast a wider net. I'm very appreciative of your interest in helping spread the word on the concert, but I, there's a million topics that we can and should get into. <laughs> so let's just make a point to do it again soon. Yeah, I'd love that. I'd love that, Austin. Yeah, thank you. So, and the good news is you'll be coming out to LA in July. So, yeah, you know, it's, we'll be seeing you then too. I guess I'll have to add it to my schedule. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Well, with that, uh, you know, thank you so much again. And, uh, and uh, yeah, thanks, everybody, for watching. And uh, we'll see all of you later. Thank you, sir. Bye.